In this episode, you will see that Bible prophecy in Daniel 2 predicts the timeline of the rise and fall of kingdoms on earth. You will understand how the battle between Jesus and Satan originated. Does the Bible predict a one world government? Does God speak through dreams? He did through King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. My name is Cami Utman, and I will be answering those questions and more right now on Unlocking Bible Prophecies. Be sure to subscribe, then click on the notification bell so you won't miss any of my upcoming videos. Chaos is increasing worldwide. There were reports of an active shooter. Divides on politics and a worldwide pandemic are sweeping our globe. It feels like the end of the world. Are we headed into a new world order? What will happen next? Join international speaker Kami Utman on a journey to unlock Bible truth and uncover key answers to your Bible questions. In Kami's travels around the world, she has documented incredible miracles while facing life and death situations. Join us for Unlocking Bible Prophecies 2.0, which will demonstrate how God has given us guidelines to successfully navigate through what lies ahead. Together, we will see how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before and how we can have hope for the future. Welcome to Unlocking Bible Prophecies. My name is Cami Utman. I am the Vice President for Adventist World Radio, and a vital part of my work is documenting miracles. This involves traveling to remote areas of the world to film miraculous testimonies of Jesus' saving power like at the DMZ border of North Korea, or meeting face-to-face -face with rebel terrorist groups in the Philippines, or visiting death row inmates in Zambia. God foretold that He would do amazing things in our day, and He is. Each night, I look forward to sharing incredible miracle stories that I have personally documented. You won't want to miss one of them. During our time together over the next 14 days, I am presenting biblical material that I personally find exciting and mind-blowing. This same information profoundly changed my life from the pursuit of the world to the pursuit of heaven. God has given me the purpose to share His Word. I trust in the Holy Bible because God's predictions or prophecies are true. That's where we will begin together. Now, if you have questions that come to mind at any time, you can click on the link below this video and your question will receive a biblical answer. Also, if you have a prayer request, click on the link below this video and our team will be happy to pray for you and your specific request. Tonight, we will begin by unlocking the truth on whether the Bible's prediction is truth or fable. The key to unlocking Bible prophecies is to let the Bible speak for itself. Our theme for this series is, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, then it's not for me. Now you may be wondering, what are the benefits of this seminar? Why does this matter to me? Why should I care? This biblical information will give meaning to your life and the conditions that we see in the world right now. The Bible informs us about the Earth's timeline, from how it began to how it will end. People need to be warned of the final events about to occur on Earth. We must become aware of Satan's many traps to deceive and distract us away from God's truths that are revealed in the Bible. We need to understand the battle between God and Satan because both are seeking your devoted worship. With all of the uncertainty in our world right now, where can we go for real answers? God's Son, Jesus, forewarns and reveals to us in His scriptures, the Bible, what we need to know. Each of our Bible topics will build and expand upon the last. Do not miss one. These topics provide us with different snapshot views of who Jesus truly is and what He teaches so we can follow in His footsteps. By the end of the series, you will know from your Bible the answers to questions like, Who is the beast of Revelation 13? What is the mark of the beast? Is 666 really in the Bible? How does God describe the seal of the living God? Did you know the Bible says you need to be sealed in order to enter heaven? We will learn what Babylon represents and how to make sure you are not a part of it. What does the Bible say happens when you die? This might surprise you. 
Did you know that God describes the characteristics of his last day remnant people, his church in Revelation? What does Revelation say is happening during the millennium? Hmm. Did you know you get to choose where you will be during these thousand years? If God is loving, would he really burn people forever and ever? We will look at what the Bible says about hell. It's different than what man has come up with. How does the Bible describe Jesus' second coming? Jesus is very specific so that we are not fooled by many false Christs. The Bible provides incredible insights on the invisible war going on around us. Friends, pray with me. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, King of our hearts, Lord, I ask that you empty me of self and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Anoint my lips with only your words and surround each one of us with holy angels as we study your word tonight. In Jesus' precious, most powerful name, amen. So friend, how do you fit into this unseen war, this battle over planet Earth? How do you fit into tonight's topic, the prediction? We will begin by unlocking the truth on whether the Bible's predictions came true and why should you care? Because no matter your age, your gender, or where you live on this planet, you are in the very center of this prediction, whether you want to be or not. So let's just see, how did we get into this predicament? Our world, planet Earth, the human race, is a territory being fought over. The enemy's intent is to claim every human heart, yours and mine, as his own territory. Scripture calls this enemy Satan, who is hell-bent on overcoming the human race. He will lie, cheat, and steal to bring us under his dominion, his control. But how did this all happen? By understanding the backstory, we will have a much easier time figuring out what is true and what is false. This angel story of epic proportions needs to be told and understood. It is about a cosmic war and a cosmic rescue. It begins within the universe in a place called heaven, home to God the Father. You see, God is all about love. The theme of love runs through the entire Bible. One of our earliest demonstrations of God's love is that he created us with the freedom of choice. There must have been a time when God explained to his angels about their free will. Perhaps God said something like, angels, I want to share with you something very precious. It is called liberty. In the beginning, before I created a single life, I had to make a decision. Should I give you the freedom or should I control your wills? If I controlled your will, I would be guaranteed your obedience, but it would have taken away your freedom of choice, which is the most precious gift I can give you. And the most precious gift you can give me is spontaneous love. And I would have been robbed of that. So I gave you liberty, freedom of choice. I knew that somewhere in the future, this could all go wrong and backfire, but I took the risk to be loved by you freely. As we all know, friends, something did go terribly wrong. A high-ranking angel named Lucifer left his place beside God the Father to stir up trouble among the angels. Lucifer became all puffed up with his high position, talents, and beauty. Pride grew in his heart and he became jealous. He desired to be God, not to be a servant of God. Let's read the many I, I, I statements Lucifer makes in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan desired to be God, to kick God off his throne and rule the universe. He appeared to give God reverence, but secretly he hid his real intention. He lied, telling the angels their own wisdom was good enough. They did not need God's laws telling them what to do. As a result, some of the angels began to doubt God and Lucifer challenged Jesus, the Son of God, for control of the universe. Lucifer desired to be his equal. In Revelation 12, 7, it says, it sums it up. 
there was war in heaven. One third of God's angelic forces joined Lucifer's rebellion and fought violently. The battle spilled out across the universe itself, and finally Lucifer and his fallen angels were cast out of heaven. So Lucifer and his deceived angels found themselves cast to a tiny planet, a territory named Earth. From the beginning of this great war between good and evil, Scripture promises us a warrior. This warrior's name is Jesus, the Son of God. He loves us so much that in advance, he devised a plan to rescue us. There is a theme from Genesis to Revelation that shows us that planet Earth is a territory under dispute. God wants us and Satan wants us. We humans need to understand this fierce battle of unseen forces going on over our planet Earth. This is a matter of life or death, friends. The very first line in the Bible is all about territories. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This sets up two regions, two territories. One, the heavens, and two, the earth. God says in Genesis 1.26, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. What does dominion mean? It means the right to rule, the power to control, the authority to govern, a territory where a ruler is in charge. In Genesis 1.28, God blessed Adam and Eve and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God is saying, The whole earth is your domain, your dwelling place. However, within the Garden of Eden, there was another place of dominion allowed, a little enemy territory called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned in Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This tree reminded Adam and Eve of their own free will to choose to obey God or not. Satan was allowed a place at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He could not just wander freely wherever he wanted to go. No. This one tree was his turf, and here he staked out his territory. Of course, Satan's goal was to expand his territory, right? He's hoping that Adam and Eve will approach his space in the garden. He's eager to spread his own governmental ideas that oppose God. All he has to do is lie about God's true character and sway human perspective on who God is, just like he did with the angels. Immediately, in the opening chapters of the Bible, in Genesis 1, 2, and especially 3, you sense there is a conflict. There is a dispute. Something is amiss. Satan disguised himself as a cunning serpent and tantalized Eve with his beauty. He lures her with a lie about magical fruit that would make her to be like God. By falling for this deception, Adam and Eve, with their own free will, transfer their authority over earth given to them by God, over to the serpent. Satan could not actually bypass their free will. He needed to verbally persuade them to change their thinking about God, to bring their free will over to his side. As Satan sways Eve's thinking with lies to question the character of God, he thinks he has won. From the very beginning, Satan lies to humans and has them question God's character. Satan's most powerful tool is to sell an idea. Ezekiel 28, 16 says, By thy multitude of your merchandising, another word for selling, thou hast sinned. You see, Lucifer was not selling items or widgets. He was marketing an illusion that Eve could become like God. He was selling ideas, and Eve bought his ideas. Scripture says that Adam was not so sure about these ideas, but he was really sure about love and Eve. And unfortunately, he followed her instead of God. Additional scripture that shows earth as a territory under the control of the enemy is found in Luke 4, 6, where Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And the devil said to Jesus, all this authority and power I will give to you and all its glory. 
for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. This Bible text uncovers the backstory. Satan is talking in terms that something has happened in the past. Someone gave him the authority. Notice Jesus does not dispute that it is Satan's to give. At no point does Jesus say, wait a minute, Satan. Earth does not belong to you. No, Jesus understands that Adam and Eve transferred their God-given authority over to Satan. Satan now has the right to make this claim. Look at these scriptures where Jesus and Paul acknowledge the position of the evil enemy. In John 12, 31, Jesus says, the ruler or prince of this world is cast down. Jesus is referencing that he is in the process of overcoming the enemy, Satan. He calls him by a title, the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul literally calls Satan the God of this age, who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Satan is currently the God of this world. In Ephesians 2, 2, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Now that doesn't mean he controls the oxygen supply. This means he is prince of the moral atmosphere or culture of this world. 1 John 5, 19 says, the whole world lies under the sway, meaning influence, of the wicked one. Are you seeing the picture the Bible is painting here? Our culture is influenced by the popular opinion of the day. The social trends are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are Satan's principles, not God's, on which our whole world operates. Now here is an interesting insight into the unseen war. Job 1 verse 1 reads, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Then, drop down a few verses, Job 1 6 says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Hmm. This verse indicates organization. You see, there was a time and there was a place, and the Lord calls a meeting. And the sons of God travel from their territories where they reside in the universe. In Ephesians, Paul calls the sons of God principalities and powers, meaning rulers and authorities in the heavenly universe. So the devil comes sauntering into this heavenly council. Notice in Job 1, 7, God asks Satan, from whence comest thou? God does not say, what are you doing here? He does not even say, get out of here. God is asking Satan for his point of origin. What right do you have to be here? Who are you representing? Where are you coming from? Here the devil proudly boasts, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Here you can see that Satan is claiming planet Earth, us, as his territory in God's universe. Satan alleges, I have a right to be here in this meeting, if all these other rulers of other worlds can attend, I can be here to represent the planet that belongs to me. Look at how God replies in verse eight. It's like, whoa, Satan. You think you represent earth, but have you considered my servant Job? He does not follow your way of thinking or living. Even there, just briefly, God begins to dispute the legitimacy of Satan's claim. Satan escalates the dialogue in verse 9, basically saying, Well, of course Job honors you. You are taking care of all of his needs. Of course he's following you, because you bought him off with all your blessings. Well, I love that in verse 8, God points to a human and says, Oh, but I have a foothold in the world. I have someone who represents me and my principles and my kingdom on earth. Satan, we are not giving up on the great controversy. We are not giving the world over to you. No, I still have some loyal people in the world that choose to follow me fully. And Job's one of them. Job's my man. So in Job 1.10, Satan accuses, well, have you not put a protective hedge around Job and his household and everything that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. 
Now, what does this hedge about Job mean? Was it a garden or a bunch of bushes? No. The answer is in Psalms 34, 7, a favorite text of mine, where it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear or honor him, and he delivers them. This hedge is God's angelic protection, his angels around his loyal followers. Satan petitions God, so remove your hedge and I will get to Job, and then he won't serve you anymore. So why did Job have this protective circle of guardian angels? Job knew the secret, friends. Man needs to ask for God's protection so that God can protect. It is a cooperative effort between the divine and the human. Think of prayer as an act of war. You are calling on your troops. Those are the rules of engagement this in the universe that we must abide by. We must ask for protection in order to receive it. In Job 1 verse 11, Satan ta taunts God. Watch and see. Job will curse you to your face. Now consider this serious fact. If Job did curse God, God would not be able to protect him. It would then place Job in Satan's territory. But Job continues to say, blessed be the name of the Lord and remains God's man. Such battles happen frequently. Satan plagues people and instead of praising God, they curse God. If people would only realize this removes God's presence away from them. A sinner's only remedy against Satan is prayer. Prayer is an act of war. Yet surprisingly, most people forget to pray, and this gives Satan the advantage in their lives. But listen, we have some exciting news. In Genesis 3, verse 15, we are given a forecast, a prediction. God promises us a way out. He predicts a savior. We have a warrior promised to us. God is speaking to Satan in the hearing of Adam and Eve, and he says this, I will put enmity, meaning hostility or hatred, between you, the devil, and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you will only bruise his heel. In this text, God is redeeming the woman, which later in scripture we will see symbolizes the church, but God gives the devil the heads up. Listen, you just took earth from Adam and Eve, but I'm going to send someone through a woman to birth a baby, and when that baby is born, he's going to be a warrior. He's going to engage you, and he's going to crush your head, Satan, and you will only injure him. Of course, Satan is going to resist this forecast, this prediction. You can imagine the hair is going to start to stand up on the back of his neck and he's gonna say, oh really, game on. Because remember, Satan had already won a third of the angels in heaven. He just won over Adam and Eve and had them believe his lies. So when God challenges him to this conflict, to a battle in Genesis three, Satan must be feeling pretty good about his chances. But what Satan has no idea about is what's coming his way. He anticipates that it will be a battle of force, but the way that God will win the war is totally unexpected. There is no way for Satan to know what is about to come. Satan is told that someone is going to come and crush his head. What the Lord doesn't say is that it will be me. God himself will come as a human being. There is a war between good and evil over every single soul. That means you and me. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, friends, we must establish in our minds that the Bible is valid and that we can trust and believe in it. A vital key story in the Bible is found in Daniel chapter two, where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Here in the book of Daniel, God gives us an insider view to show humanity the timeline of earth's territories or kingdoms so that there is no question who God is because he declares the end from the beginning. Look what God says about himself in Isaiah 48, verse nine and 10. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient time, the things that are not yet done. Wow, 
God promises he will tell you ahead of time what will happen from the beginning until the end of time. There's no need to guess. So why does Daniel 2 matter? Well, although the book of Daniel was written thousands of years ago, it is brimming with vital information for today's world. The prophet Daniel received words from God about the kingdoms that shaped world's history. This short prophecy is fundamental in helping us unlock more complex prophecies in Daniel and Revelation that discuss this great controversy between the forces of good and the forces of evil. So let's go back in time to about 600 years before Christ, to the greatest city that ever existed on the planet, Babylon. Let's make our way into an ancient king's palace made of shimmering gold. It's nighttime and we find King Nebuchadnezzar tossing and turning in his royal bed. The great king is having an intense dream. Suddenly he wakes. He's very troubled. Even though it was just moments before, he cannot seem to remember the dream. He knew it had been extraordinary. Indeed, it was a prophetic dream given by God, outlining history for the next two and a half thousand years. Daniel 2 verse 1 says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. You see, the king was agitated and very distraught. He summoned his wise men, magicians and astrologers and sorcerers and Chaldeans to his royal palace. Now you might be thinking, how primitive. Here's a man, he had a dream, and he summons enchanters? That's what kings did in ancient days. They were considered wise insiders. Each one of these categories had a certain function. The enchanter would throw and read charms. The sorcerer was a deep occultist using occult communications to find things out. The astrologers would look at the stars to tell him what to do. Is this really an ancient custom or is it alive and well today? Do presidents and prime ministers use this system today? Oh, yes, they do. King Nebuchadnezzar instructed them, tell me what I dreamed last night and tell me its significance. I know it was vitally important, but I can't remember it. What's the meaning of my dream? The wise men replied, Daniel 2 verse 4, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and then we will give the interpretation. Oh, the king was upset. He says, I don't know what I dreamed. He's, don't you see? God had mysteriously took it from his mind. So in Daniel 2 verse 9, the king insists, therefore, Tell me the dream and I will know that you can give me its interpretation. In other words, don't pretend you know what you really don't know. You're supposed to be able to see into the future. Now prove it to me. Tell me what I dreamed. So in Daniel 2 verse 10, the Chaldeans, who were the highly educated ones in this informed group, like the intelligentsia of the day, well, they protested and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. And it was true. There was no one on earth that could do what the king asked. God removed this dream from the king's mind so that it would expose all of these counterfeit informers. Only the God of heaven could reveal what the king dreamed in his bedroom. And only the God of heaven can accurately, precisely reveal the future. News of the king's command to kill all the king's wise men reached Daniel. You see, Daniel was not a psychic, but he was one of the king's wise men. When Daniel asked why he was to be killed, Arioch, the executioner, told him the story of the dream. Daniel was granted permission to go before the king and said, King, give me time. Let me go and pray and ask the God of heaven. And the God of heaven will reveal the dream that you had in your bedroom. And I will return and explain it to you what you dreamed. So Daniel prayed and God revealed the dream and its interpretation to his servant, Daniel. You see, friends, the mysteries of God are explained to men and women who pray. So in Daniel 2, verse 23, he says, I thank you and praise you, O God of, fa of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. And then Daniel went before the king, stating that it was true that no wise man, no astrologer, no magician could reveal the dream. 
And Daniel 2 verse 28 says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Hmm. I love that Daniel doesn't take the credit. He gives all the credit to God. This is important. You see, there are two religious systems on this planet right now. The one system is man-centered and the other is God-centered. And this is the battle for every soul on this planet. You will be surprised who today advocates a man-centered religion. As we go on throughout the series, you will see for yourself, friends. Now back to Daniel. Chapter 2, verse 21. God removes kings and sets up kings. I love that. So it's going to be a story of how kingdoms rise and disappear on the planet. This prophecy takes us down the stream of time from Daniel's day through the nations of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, even to the current divided empires of Europe. So Daniel chapter 2 is for our time, friends. As God said in the latter days, God reveals to Daniel in verse 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent and stood before you, and its form was awesome. Next it says, This image's head was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone or rock was cut out without hands, when struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then verse 35, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind, which is a symbol of war in the Bible, carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Daniel 2, verse 36 to 38. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. The head of gold represented Babylon, or Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. His kingdom ruled the world from 605 BC to 539 BC. Nebuchadnezzar established one of the most fantastic, wealthiest empires in the entire world. His kingdom was lavishly adorned with gold. In just one temple alone, Nebuchadnezzar used 18 tons of gold. That's 16,000 kilograms. He even built for his queen the Hanging Gardens, a wonder of the ancient world. It is a fact that gold is a precious metal, whereas silver is less precious, but it is harder. You see, each kingdom carried on the philosophy of man-made teachings from the previous kingdom, thereby becoming more brutal and less refined, all the way down to the legs of iron. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had built up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. The whole earth lay prostrate at her feet. Daniel pointed at the king and said, Your kingdom will disappear. The proud king said, Whoa, never! And he initially humbled himself, but then he later hardened his heart and thought to himself, Babylon will last forever. I will defy the king of kings. My kingdom of gold will never be destroyed. It will never go to silver, to bronze, to iron or clay. I will build myself a statue of gold from head to foot. Now, what was Nebuchadnezzar really saying there? He was defying the God of heaven. He was saying, I oppose you, God. I will set up my kingdom and you will not destroy it. Is it possible that there is a power today claiming the same thing? And is it in opposition to God's kingdom? Yes. We will see that is exactly the case. It is an unfortunate reality, but it is a reality. Stay tuned, but don't worry. God has a plan to save you. Daniel's prophecy goes on. Daniel 2, verse 32. It's chest and arms of silver. After Babylon, another kingdom would arise, you see. The Medes and Persians overthrew the Babylonians. You don't have to guess at the meaning of prophecy. Just look at it in Daniel 2, verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Bible prophecy predicted the nation of Babylon would not last forever. 
another kingdom would arise. History reveals exactly how this happened. In Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar, grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, hosted a drunken feast for a thousand of his lords. And as the wine was flowing, the music was playing, long-robed men held closer lavishly dressed women. In the midst of the drunken debauchery, the enchanting music, and the seductive immorality, God interrupted Belshazzar's feast. A bloodless hand wrote upon the wall these words, Mini, which means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tiko, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Daniel's interpretation can be verified by any good history book on Babylon. You see, Cyrus, the general of the armies of the combined countries of Media and Persia, overthrew the proud kingdom of Babylon. Daniel, however, was not the only one who predicted this. In fact, God named Cyrus approximately 150 years before he was born. Wow! Look at this amazing prediction written by Isaiah the prophet sometime around 680 B.C. In Isaiah 45, verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Here is exactly what happened, friends. His soldiers dug canals to divert and dry up the river Euphrates and marched under the walls of Babylon. They came through the open gates into the city. The Bible is not an ordinary book. When you and I open the word of God, we are opening the word of the living God. Its prophecies are indeed true. Next, Daniel 2 verse 39. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Alexander the Great led his armies with their bronze armor. If you were going to go to the Acropolis Museum today, located in Athens, Greece, you would find how fitting it is for this third nation to be represented by bronze. There you can see the armory that the ancient soldiers wore. With all their military advances that Greece had, coupled with the wisdom of Alexander the Great and his military expertise, the nation of Greece was able to conquer the then known world in lightning speed. He acquired the largest empire up to that time. By the age of 32, Alexander achieved what it took many an entire lifetime to do. After attaining world dominance at his young age, he was soon on his deathbed, which was thought to be as a result of his intemperate behavior. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, but would Greece rule the world forever? Hmm, Daniel 2, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. The great English historian Edward Gibbon, though not a Christian or Bible believer himself, wrote in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, quote, The images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron mar monarchy of Rome. Indeed, that happened. Rome dominated the world from 168 BC to 476 AD. It was in the days of Rome that baby Jesus was born, that Joseph and Mary fled from the oppressive Roman Empire into Egypt. Jesus was tried by a Roman governor and crucified by Roman soldiers. For more than 500 years, Rome appeared to be invincible as one of the largest empires in the world. But what did the Bibles predict? Daniel 2 verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. The Bible did not predict a fifth ruling empire which would rise after Rome. It predicted a divided empire. Another single world empire would not follow Rome. The feet of iron and clay represent the divisions of the Roman Empire. Europe was divided like the prophecy described it would be. Daniel 2 verse 43 declares, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as the iron does not mix with clay. Throughout history, the kings of Europe attempted through intermarriage to unite the empire. 
One famous example of this was Napoleon divorced his wife Josephine and married Louise of Austria in order to secure their country's relations and further his goal to unite all of Europe. As prophecy predicted, he utterly failed. Besides intermarriage, there was a second way political leaders attempted to unite Europe. They attempted to accomplish their goals through military conflict and war. Charles V wanted to unite Europe. He failed. Charlemagne wanted to unite Europe. He failed. Napoleon tried to unite all of Europe. He failed too. Napoleon wrote in his journal a description of his ambitious plans. There will be one Europe. There will be one currency. There will be one language. There will be one government over all of Europe. But when Napoleon was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo in June of 1815, he said, God Almighty is too much for me. Friends, the Bible is accurate. Europe has been divided. Charles V, Charlemagne, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin were would-be world leaders, and they have all failed. Consider Hitler and his fiery speeches, whipped the, how they whipped up the masses. His motto was, one people, one empire, one leader. It appeared he was going to accomplish his ambitious goal and unite all of Europe. The Allied forces were trapped. Defeat seemed certain. But remarkably, Hitler ordered his tanks to stop and resupply. What stopped Hitler's tanks? An ancient prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 declares that from the days of the Roman Empire, Europe would never be united. The Bible predicts in the book of Revelation a final last attempt to unite Europe, this time under a religious political union. It's found in Revelation 17 verses 12 to 14. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority from one, for one hour as kings with the beast. Here is the significance of this prophecy. For a short period of time, the nations of Europe and the rest of the world will enter into a religious political confederation just before the coming of Jesus. Notice how Revelation describes this temporary unity. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So here is a prediction that for one hour, a short period of time, the nations of Europe would come together. So are they? Are there movements to unite Europe today? To unite the whole world? The flag that is a symbol of the common market of Europe is many voices, one people. The euro is a result of an uh, effort that seeks to establish a common currency for Europe. Revelation tells us there will be this final attempt to unite people to prepare the beast power that joins them religiously and politically under one great system. When worldwide strife, conflict, and war combine with famines, pestilences, and economic failures, the idea will be so sweetly presented. A united world. A united society. We will all become one. But the Bible says... These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, who is Jesus, and the Lamb will overcome them. The reason why we are not interested in an earthly kingdom is because Jesus has promised us a heavenly one. This prediction in Revelation 17 says, For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are chosen, called, and faithful. History has followed the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 like a blueprint and will continue to do so. The political workings of this planet are not random. Events happening in the world this very minute are a sign that Jesus, the King of Kings, will come soon. His return is the only hope for a planet standing on feet of iron and clay, ready to crumble. Daniel's prophecy of the image and Revelation's prophecies point us forward to a new time. Daniel 2, verse 34, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Verse 44, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So what is the rock that smashes the image? The rock of ages. King Jesus, we can have no confidence in earthly kingdoms that rise and fall. They are temporary, illusionary but we can put our trust in God's kingdom that will never fall. 
We are in a cosmic war and our cosmic rescue is on the way. Christ's supernatural kingdom will come and smash down all the kingdoms of this world. Revelation 11:15 says, And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he shall reign forever and ever. The great longing of the human heart is for peace and security. We long for a stable society where we can bring up our children without the fear of war, poverty, and devastating diseases. We want a future filled with hope, not fear. The image of Daniel 2 makes me think of a story uh, about Freddie that my AWR video crew and I filmed in South Africa. Freddie grew up in a very religious home. His father was a priest, but he just didn't care about it. Then as an adult, he ignored everything to do with God until one day he received a phone call that his sister had been murdered. Freddie's immediate anger turned into rage and hopelessness. He drowned his problems in alcohol. Ultimately, his self-destructive behavior progressed to suicidal thoughts. He would drink all day, then at night intentionally sleep on a busy road, hoping to be run over. Thankfully, the police or his friends would always return him home safe. When he would finally wake up and out of his drunken stupor, he could not remember how he had made it home. It was in one of these moments that God got Freddie's attention. One night he heard a voice say, Who am I? And he answered, I don't know. God said, Think nicely. Love is an endless forgiveness. What's interesting is that Freddie learned about his sister's last Facebook comment, which just said the exact same thing. The Holy Spirit urged him to open his Bible and Freddie wondered if Jesus could fill his empty heart. Freddie struggled with how he could know for sure he could trust what his sister said. How could she know what the Bible said and what was true and not just a fairy tale someone made up? During his studies, he became fascinated in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. He became intrigued with how history supported the rise and fall of kingdoms just like Daniel 2 predicted and right on time in the predicted order. Freddie was convinced he could believe what the Bible taught. He is now a de devoted to teaching others about the Bible beginning with Daniel 2 because it proves the Bible is authentic and credible, lining right up with history because history cannot be denied. We are living in a broken world tonight and it can't give us any answers, friends, but the Bible does. And as we have seen, we are living in the time of the toes of the great image that we have just studied. We know it won't be long before the rock cut without hands will come and smite the image, destroying all earthly powers forever. Jesus will come to set up his kingdom. I really want to be there, don't you? Until then, when everything in this world is upside down, thank you, Lord, that this broken world is cradled by you. Nothing on this earth can take Jesus by surprise. He has got everything covered, and he tells us not to fear. We only need to believe in him. Don't you want to believe tonight that there is a God in heaven who is our King and Savior, a God who loves us so much, he has given us a sneak peek in Daniel 2, just how earth's history would play out. It has happened exactly as he predicted. God does not throw curveballs or blindside us. He's clear and he never changes. We can count on every word. Jesus reaches out to you tonight. He invites you to ask him into your heart. Choose today to make the commitment to seriously discover what God and his kingdom are all about. Friend, can God claim your heart and mind as his territory tonight? If your answer is yes, click the link below and our team will pray for you. And before we close tonight, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are a mighty God that has a power to set up kingdoms and remove kings. Tonight, we thank you for letting us know in advance how you will protect and provide for us. We trust in you. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Friends, I'd love to meet with you right back here tomorrow night 
as we are going to have a special study on what are the signs that are going to happen right before Jesus comes. Is COVID-19 in the Bible? Don't miss our next topic, the signs. God loves us so much, he warns us in advance, not to scare us, but to inform us. Choose God's way. Good night, friends. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more Bible truth, I invite you to subscribe below. Also, click here to watch one of my favorite videos. And click here, top left, to watch this series in full. God bless you.